uh, start off this time by lighting the candle for Jeremy. Jeremy responded last Sunday to the message. I met with him this week, and he bowed the knee to Jesus. Let's give Jeremy a round of applause. Uh, been following up with Jeremy all week long, and he is on a new a new path. He's already memorized 2 Corinthians 5.17, that if any person is Christ Jesus, they are a new creation, the old is gone, behold, the new has come. And he wrote me, uh, I think it was on Friday, and said, wow, I didn't know how much uh, goes into this journey. And uh, I just want to say for each of you that uh, when you accept Christ, truly the old is gone, the new has come, and there's this grace that, that now not only gives us a new status with God, a grace that gives us a new standing as a child of God from being a slave to fear and insecurity and worry to now being uh, a child of God who's in the security and in the perfect love of the Father. And I just want to say that if you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm praying for you today, that today will be the day of your salvation, and that as I share about Jesus and who he is as the one who's been lifted up, he is the one lifted up. He's lifted up high and mighty on the cross, uh, the crucified king, the king who came to take on our suffering, to, to share with us our iniquities and our infirmities, a God who knows your suffering, a God who knows what it is to be betrayed, abandoned, to, to lose friends, to, to see death. And Jesus gives us hope because he defeated death. And so we who face death all day long those of us who know that death is that final enemy to be defeated. Jesus give, has given us the hope of the new heaven, new earth, where death will be defeated. The grave will not have the last word because Christ will raise up his bride to himself. He will raise up his people. And that's why we, in this time of the church, in this time of grace, in this time of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost upon his church, we are to proclaim the good news of who Jesus is as high and lifted up. And so this whole series of messages for the last seven weeks have been focused on who is Jesus and how should we respond to him. And day, today is week seven, day seven of that. And next week we start a new series that leads us right into Easter called responding to the passion of jesus so if you have questions about how did jesus suffer us what did he go through so that we can be saved so we can become a part of his family come these next eight weeks as we dive into a teaching on what jesus did so that we can be healed so we can be rescued so that we can be delivered then obviously invite family friends neighbors co-workers to Easter Sunday in addition to the next seven weeks because we're going to be talking about the resurrection from the dead and how important that teaching is and the new heaven, new earth and what we have to look forward to. So I just encourage you that if this is your first Sunday or you've been here longer than I've been here, then keep coming and learning about who Jesus is and how we then respond to him and what Jesus did for us and how then we respond to him. Because at our church, there's only one name we lift up. And it's not my name, and it's not the name on the side of the building. It's the name of Jesus. Because it's only by the name of Jesus that anyone can be saved and that anyone can be healed, rescued, or delivered. And so today we're focusing on the fact that Jesus calls himself the Lord of the harvest. And the big word that we're focusing on responds to the fact that Jesus is the Lord harvest is go. Jesus is the Lord of harvest. The harvest, go on mission with him. And we're going to see that Jesus has invited us to pray for people to work his fields. Jesus is calling us to not only pray, but he's calling us to put feet to that prayer. Sometimes you are the answer to the prayer that you're praying for someone else. Amen? You know what I mean by that? Lord, please provide food for that family because I know they're going through a hard financial time. Maybe you're the family to drop off a bag of groceries. It's that simple. That's how the mission works. You pray and then you trust that if God puts something on your heart, you do it. If, God, that God, if you're not the one who's having it put on your heart, you trust that God's putting it on someone else's heart. But the key that you're going to learn today, here's the bottom line up front, is, is that as we pray, we're going to listen and we're going to obey what God tells us to do because we can be the answer to that prayer. 
but at the same time, I don't want to layer you with more guilt and expectation and burden that you should because ultimately, I don't want you to feel like you're the only person out there who can do anything. Otherwise, you have this crushing weight of responsibility about I'm the only obedient person in this whole church. Otherwise, every meal plan would be filled and every need would be met. The reality is you keep being faithful to what God called you to do. And let's continue to pray to the Lord of Harvest that other people, by the power of the Holy Spirit and not by the preacher's guilt or someone else's rolling of their eyes, not through man's ways, but through the Holy Spirit, people will respond to what they're supposed to do. And then we can trust him to meet the needs. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's unpack that. So the scripture is Luke 10. We're only going to look at three verses. In the Sunday school class that I'm now teaching, I, I think that we read like 300 verses because that class is going deeper and we're studying scripture deeply. And it's an awesome class. Um, I can't do that here um, because I would lose too many people too quickly. So we're going to do three verses. Here they are, Luke 10, 1 through 3. And that's not me talking down to anybody, by the way. That's just the reality of this kind of teaching form. This, this kind of teaching form, you, you, it's just hard to keep such a diverse audience moving together in one direction. All right, here we go. Luke 10, 1 through 3. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. So, Father, this is your word. Your word will not return void. And so as I teach this morning, Lord, may I teach nothing but your word. Your word is eternal and everlasting. Come, Holy Spirit, and activate faith within us to live out your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is not the only place that Jesus gives his followers a command to take the good news to other people. In the church world, we call that evangelism or outreach or being a part of the mission of God. Sometimes we pluralize the word mission to say missions, okay? So you've heard this kind of language before, maybe. Uh, go to your neighbor. Even the last song we sang ended with the thought that in response to this song, how are we going to bring the love to others? You see, because Christianity was never intended to be a private religion, it was meant to be a personal relationship with Jesus that becomes community-focused, community focused Tra uh, transformational to you and the community starting with where you're at and we're going to get into that but I just want to emphasize that in Matthew 28 18 to 20 Jesus gives these words to his his disciples he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me if you don't believe that Jesus is the son of God that's a very audacious statement. If you think Jesus is just a good guy who lived once upon a time and was a moral teacher, I just want to tell you that one statement alone should, um, what's the word, should cure you of that view of Jesus. Because any person who just is a good moral teacher who says all authority on earth and heaven has been given to me, therefore, I would run for your life. Okay, if you ever hear me say something like that, please run. Please throw rotten tomatoes at me. Seriously, I, I deserve it if I ever make a statement like that. Only one can make a statement like that, and that's Jesus because of who he is. So all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, says Jesus, not Jerry. Go, therefore, and that's why I'm holding up the Bible as I read it. I don't want you to be confused. Go, therefore, and make disciples, followers of Jesus, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So, with that foundation, moving back to our text in Luke 10, 1 through 3, knowing that Jesus commands us to go 
in response to the fact that he is the Lord of the harvest, I have a couple application points for you. And the first one is going to be the quickest point I've ever made in this church. You ready? Here it is. Point number one. The work is not just for pastors and missionaries. Jesus sent 72 others. Not just the 12 apostles. This is the mission of the whole church. Not just of missionaries and pastors. There is no separation or divide in the church between those who are called and those who are not called. If there is a separation in the church, it's between those who are saved and those who are not. But only God knows that and the proof's in the pudding. Point two. Got it? All right. I said a lot there in a little statement, but we're going to keep going, because that was kind of fun, right, Nick? Yeah, he gave me a thumbs up. Yeah, he likes stuff like that. All right, point two. It's right here in the text, okay, of where we're at in, in Luke 10, verses 1 through 3. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two. Ready for point two? Don't go alone. This is not just for pastors and missionaries. This is for the church if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then with that lordship comes the call to the Lord of the harvest. But don't go alone. Jesus sent the workers two by two because each of us needs a battle buddy. Now, that's an army term, so let me explain it. Because battle buddy, you're like, what are you trying to say here? A battle buddy. In ranger school, we call them ranger buddies. And so let, to, to illustrate what a battle buddy or a ranger buddy is... When I was in ranger school, this is back in 1997, so I'm dating myself here. Um, uh, I was in the Florida phase of ranger school, and so we're deep in the ranger school at this point. We're down in, in the, I think it's the Everglades. We're down in Florida. We're, we're in the swamps, and at this point, I had been deprived of food and sleep for many days on end, and I was starting to just not be able to function very well. And this sergeant from the Special Forces was my ranger buddy, and he grabbed me by the arm this one night. We're doing an all-night movement, and I'm exhausted, and my brain is no longer functioning. You ever get so tired your brain doesn't function? Okay, now multiply that by lack of food, lack of sleep, uh, un under fire, under pressure. And this ranger buddy, battle buddy, literally locks arms with me and keeps me going all night long. I don't even really remember too much about that. I, all I know is that if it wasn't for my battle buddy, I wouldn't have had a ranger tab on my shoulder, and my career pretty much would have been over. Um, as a military officer, especially in the infantry, uh, that was a deal breaker. And so that one man, and there was other times throughout ranger school, throughout my time in the 82nd Airborne, and I know many of you who have served in the military can share stories about when someone else came alongside of you and it saved your life or it kept you going. That's just an illustration. We all need a battle buddy. If you are going to go into this harvest field, you can't go alone. The, the, the church doesn't need lone rangers, people who think they can do it on their own. Because that pride comes before the fall. And it, not, it just doesn't hurt you and your marriage and your family. It hurts all of us. Um, and so I just want to encourage you that it's harder at times than we think. So we need someone to go with us. There is hardship and pain awaiting for us out there. And, and that's just a real statement about real life. Jesus says here in verse, um, chapter 10, verse 3 of Luke Go your way, behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. I, I, want, I want to basically remind you of this. This is not news to anyone here. Many of you can come up here and share testimony after testimony of the hardship that we have out there. There is hardship and pain awaiting us all. I am not speaking that over us. I am just saying we live in a broken, fallen world, and we need to be sensitive to that. We need to be compassionate about that. We live in a broken world filled with sadness and grief, sin and selfishness. Bad things happen to all of us, and all we have sometimes is the faith and the hope and the love that's been given to us by Jesus. Sometimes that's all we have to hang on to, 
because things can be taken from us with one phone call. Your sense of health can be taken away with one biopsy, one phone call. Your sense of safety and security can be taken away by one tragic car accident and you get the phone call late one night. You know, um, a pink slip. Something can happen that just changes our sense of normal and normal never happens, never seems to come back again. And I just want to acknowledge that, that that's the world we're sent into and that's the world we live in. That's real. I, I don't teach a happy, clappy Christianity. I teach a following of Jesus in the real world. Because we don't need fake, we need real, and there's pain out there, and we are called to go into that pain. But at the same time, we have our own pain. <sighs> and that's hard. I just want to acknowledge that. I want to remind us that we're not supposed to go alone. We need friends on the journey with us. Now, I want to give three verses to help you see why that's important. First, I'm going to just, you can turn with me if you want, but I'm just going to read these just to help you hear them. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 17 to 18, Paul says, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus. Those are two Greek names, and even worse, Achaeus. I probably did terrible at that. Achaeus, Achaeus. I don't know, I'm not Greek. Um, so I, I rejoice at the coming of three brothers who have hard names to pronounce because they have made up for your absence. So Paul was alone. Three, three brothers came to be with him. And he said this about this fellowship, these relationships. They refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. We need to recognize that there's people amongst us who come beside us and refresh us. And I don't know who that is in your life. Maybe it's someone from the church. Maybe it's someone from your family. But I hope everybody here has someone that refreshes them. I hope you are that someone for someone else. Who are you refreshing? I know it, it's kind of our sin slant to think about, well, who's refreshing me? And I'm going to be honest with you. I understand how brokenness and the pain of our past can cause us to always default towards that point of view my pain and my brokenness from the past can always cause me to interpret the world about who's there to refresh me but i'm telling you that's not the way to thrive that mindset is one birthed out of pain and insecurity and fear because of our past the command of the mission to go is to no longer be a slave of fear to be that broken person but to be healed through the hope and the love of jesus so that we can ask a different question who can i bring refreshment to I know that's hard. Please, I'm empathizing with us about how our pain causes us to be narcissistic and egocentrical. And that's not me being negative towards you. I'm just saying that is what suffering does. Chronic pain and suffering causes us to think about ourselves. And when you've lived in that for so long, it's, you, it's hard to change your thinking. Jesus came to transform you by the renewing of your mind so that the question no longer is, who's going to be there for me in my suffering, but it's how can God use my suffering and my experiences as his comfort in that suffering to go bring comfort to others in the midst of their suffering. And that's 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, by the way. What I just taught you is a biblical principle, that God comforts us in every one of our discomforts so that we can bring that comfort to others. But I know that's a mind shift, and I'm, I want to be very sensitive about it. So if you're not there yet, I pray that people will come around you and comfort you. If you're going through an acute pain right now, please do not hear me telling you, go help other people. If you're in an acute crisis right now, if you have a loss, I pray that people in your family and church will come around, right you, right around you right now and just love you. But please know that God is providing that love for you so that one day when someone else is going through a similar experience you are, you'll be able to love them through it. When my wife and I lost our baby, uh, 2011 seems a world ago but every day we think about Skylar because when people ask me how many kids I have my answer is four but that's not socially polite because no one wants the drama so I say three and the reality is though there's not a day that goes by that we don't think about our baby but we were comforted so well by you I remember being here on that Sunday morning weeping broken and you came around at me 
uh, came around us so well. So thank you for that. And now we hope to come around others um, all these years later. And that's life. That's when through marriage difficulties, through financial difficulties, maybe you're in a season of plenty right now and you have financial well-being and you're healthy and you know someone who's not and you were helped way back here and so now you can help them. Does that make sense? That's the way it works. But our culture teaches us to keep thinking we should be the one who's taken care of and blessed. And so that feeds that what about me mentality. But the church is crucified of that so that we can go. Okay, I'm taking too long on this point, but I hope it helps. I hope that helps. 2 Corinthians 7.13, Paul reiterates the same point. 2 Corinthians 7.13, you can write that down. Here it is. Therefore, we are comforted, and besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus. Hi, Titus. There's a Titus right there. But we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Do you hear how there's a refreshing of the spirit through people? And I'm going to give you one real quick geek note and I'm going to move on. The same Greek word used for refreshing here is the same word that Jesus used when he says, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. It's a one-word promise. The Greek word is the same one here for refreshed. Isn't that cool? That the same rest that Jesus gives us through our relationship with him is the refreshment you can give one another through your relationships? To me, the fact that that word is used, the same word, is just, wow. There is power in you because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You can give someone the same thing Jesus can give them. Not salvation, of course, but yeah. I don't need to disclaim that, do I? I'll just say it again. You can give people the same thing that Jesus gives you. Fair? And then finally, a verse that's used to beat people over the head by church leaders in wearing bow ties and suit jackets <laughs> is this one. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, but don't hear it as a heavy club. Hear it in the same way that you just heard about refreshing. Okay, I'm going to rephrase, I'm going to reclaim this verse for you so you don't just hear it as a guilt-inducing verse when you miss church. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, with a capital D, drawing near. That's a verse that encourages you that when you miss church, you're missing the refreshing of the saints. You're missing something. Your week is not going to be, it's not going to go the same. It doesn't mean you're not going to have hardship. It doesn't mean you're not going to have suffering. But when you go through it alone, it's so much different than when you go through it with other people. But you can also come to church and still be alone. True? So I'm going to encourage you, if you're still alone in this church, you can have the broken mindset about that. And I'm not saying anything about anyone here. I'm just saying this is real. We can live in that place of why is no one coming towards me to refresh? Or we can be the ones who engage and we can bring refreshment. Um, it's always a choice. There's always a choice there. Always, always, always a choice. And I'm telling you, sin will pull you towards the gravitational pull of self-pity, which is unattractive and no one wants to be around you. Or the Spirit can release you to a place of service and comforting others, which is very attractive, and then everybody wants you and you're overwhelmed. Right, Scott? It's easy to become overwhelmed when everyone knows you're a person who will care for them and comfort them and be there when they call. No one's going to call you when within 30 seconds of the conversation you've turned it back on you and what you're going through and you're not even listening anymore. Sound true to your human experience? Does it? You can tell real quickly who's a good listener and who's not by how quickly it takes them to turn the story back on them. So we're better together in Jesus. We are. We are better together in Jesus. So I said it once, I'll say it one last time, they're going to move to point three. Be a refreshing presence. Be a refreshing, rejuvenating, restorative, healing, comforting, delivering, and rescuing, saving presence. Don't live in the drama of always needing to be the person who is needing all those things. Now there are times where you need those things. But if you're living in acute crisis all the time, some people just need drama to know they're alive. 
I would say you can replace the drug of needing drama and to be alive with service. Go bring service to others. Enter into their pain and help them. It's a game changer, friends. Please trust the word of God and trust me as an interpreter of scripture. It's a game changer when you start bringing the love and the hope of Jesus to a world in, such much, in so much conflict and pain because we're hope bearers. Christians are called to be hope bearers, not doomsdayers. The promise of the new heaven, new earth is hope giving, not doomsdaying. The return of Jesus is hope for the church. We are to invite people into that hope by our love, and they will know you are my disciples by your love. So going is about loving. Loving is about receiving and then giving what you never earned in the first place. And that leads us to our third point. And I love this point. And this is, this is a hobby horse point of mine. So please keep me focused so we can get to the end. Point number three, go to every place Jesus would go. Stay in his yoke. Go to every place Jesus would go. Listen to the scripture, Luke 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. Jesus will never ask you to go somewhere that he is not willing to go himself. True? But church, sometimes we disallow each other from going to the places Jesus would go because we have turned Christianity into a moralistic religion. And God forbid someone sees your car parked in front of that place or that person's house. When you're going where Jesus told you to go, but you're scared about what judgment will be brought upon you by good moral people who are disallowing you from staying in the yoke of Jesus because of their own hypersense of morality, which is a skewed understanding of Christianity. That's a loaded statement, I know. Come talk to me later if that offends all of your sensibilities. Acts 1.8 Acts 1.8 instructs us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now I want to unpack that for you quickly. This scripture has two lessons for us. First, you've got to start where you're at. Jerusalem in this text means your hometown with people like you. Jewish people start in Jerusalem. That's the context. That's the historical context. Start with the principle is you start your mission where you're at with people like you, people you're comfortable with. You practice where it's safer. You share love where it's comfortable. So church, you hopefully can practice loving each other here in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, in your schools. The second thing is you don't stop there though. You then go to what's after Jerusalem? Jerusalem all Judea. Judea still represented Jewish people, people who still were like each other, but it's a broader range. It's a broader region. So for us, it may leave our neighborhood, our schools, and go to the region, or to people who are still like us, but not in our everyday lives. Our kids' activities don't overlap with gymnastics or bowling or whatever it is, basketball, whatever it is you do. And then it doesn't, it doesn't stop there, though. Listen to this. And then it says Samaria. And that's a loaded term for Jewish people because they had ethnic hatred towards the Samaritans. They had historical tensions with the Samaritans. In fact, they weren't to be caught dead anywhere near Samaritans because they had become richly unclean and unable to do their religious worship. When it says, go Jerusalem, Judea, and then to Samaria, he is saying, now get out of your comfort zone and go to people that all those other good Christian people will judge you for going to. And don't worry about their judgment because I am the Lord and you submit to me, not to the people-pleasing poles of your church. Because there will always be people in the church of every church who will judge you for being like Jesus because my, here's my thought, if Jesus were to return today, this is probably not the place he would be right now. He'd probably be in the bars and where the prostitutes are and where the people our world says are worse sinners than us. But that's a worldly point of view because every sin is sin. And all sin is rebellion. And it's worldly ways of thinking that one person is better than another, that one sin is worse than another. That's the world's way of thinking. 
Not so for us as a church. If Jesus were to return right now, and I'm not talking about the rapture, I know it's just me, me thinking out loud, sorry, I know this is going to mess with some of you, but if Jesus were to come right now and do ministry, there's a good chance he's not going to give me a whole lot of time to sit down and have a Bible study with him to answer all my questions and concerns. He's going to be on mission to seek and save the lost. And if he does come to us, it's probably to turn the tables on us and to ask us why we're so caught up with our own agendas and off mission. It probably wouldn't be to come here and say, well done, good and faithful servant. It would probably be a whole lot more, whoa, you hypocrites, you whitewashed tombs. You're greedy for your own future retirements and you don't give or your time or whatever. Whatever the issue that you have. I talk about money just because Jesus talked about it a lot more than I do, trust me. For those of you who think I do, this much compared to Jesus. And also, that's our cultural issue. We worship manna. We worship money or mammon. We worship mammon. We don't worship. We, worship, we find our security in something other than Jesus. As a people, generalization. So let me keep going. That's Samaria. Get out of your comfort zone and finally go to the ends of the earth, which means anywhere, everywhere, anywhere, anywhere, everywhere, at any time, as Jesus leads you. There are no boundaries. I've done the immigration thing before without being partisan political. What are the immigration policies of your heart? What are the boundaries and borders of your heart that prevent you from obeying Jesus? And I'm not talking about politics. It's just a hot political issue. But before it was a hot political issue, it's always been a real human issue. Are you willing to go to anyone, anytime, anywhere if Jesus commands you? And that's the key. That's, that's why the yoke imagery is so important here because missions, obeying the Lord of the harvest is 100% dependent upon you finding your rest in the victory of Jesus. You finding your rest and being in the yoke of Jesus causes you then to go where he tells you to go to bring comfort and compassion to he, who he tells you to go to and you're not insecure and fear, fearful about what the church would say about it or what some other Christian would say about it or what some blogger would say about it or how someone on Facebook would blow you up about it. You go where Jesus commands you to go because you're at rest in who Jesus is and you're not insecure and fearful about what other people say. And so you can be on mission because you're going by the grace of God, with the grace of God. You're not performing. And I want you to really get that out of today's message. When you take on Jesus' yoke, Jesus will direct your path, and he'll set the pace of your ministry. If you feel like there's not enough time in the day, there's a very good chance that you're doing things that he never asked you to do, and you're out of his yoke. We don't have a time issue, friends. We have a priority issue. We don't have a financial issue, friends. We have a heart trust issue. That's true for the church. That's true for you. It's true for me. It's because we're constantly battling with this reality of are we submitting to Jesus and doing what Jesus has asked us to, or are we busy being insecure and fearful about what other people expect of us so we'd be accepted? And we bring that into our marriages. And a marriage which is supposed to be a place of equally yoked resting. Get the imagery? Not exclusivity, but equal rest, equal faith is resting because you're not being insecure and fearful with one another. You're both seeking the Lord's approval and in that you're being pleasing to one another. But we all bring baggage. <laughs> we all bring real stuff to our marriages. I get that. I do too. Jesus doesn't want the mission or the call to evangelism to be a burden. Nothing Jesus commands us is burdensome. Jesus said that himself in 1 John. None of his commands are burdensome. His commands are to love. We're the ones who are creating the burden. We do it to each other in the church. Like Brandon's imagery was awesome. Mom driving like a NASCAR driver. Don't make me come back there. You know, don't make me pull over this car and get to church. All of a sudden it's like, everything's great. We do that. We do that. We create these cultures and I want us to go on a journey together to create a new culture. I want First Baptist Church in 2020 and beyond to be so transformed by the reviving presence of the Holy Spirit that this is a place 
where we can be on journey with one another, where it's not pastors and elders and congregation, but it's us going together two by two, going where Jesus would go. And we have this culture where I don't judge you or put on you what my call is and you don't put on me what your call is, but we build each other up to go and be on mission with Jesus because we're learning how to find rest for our souls in his yoke. I want us to go on that journey together because the call to missions is journey. It's not destination. It's not perfection, it's progression. Jesus is going to take care of the perfection. You can't. All you can do is be faithful today to get in the rest in the yoke of Jesus and for us to be there for each other and to pray for each other and support each other. And that brings us to our last point. It says right here, pray. This is a quick point. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. It doesn't say nag. It doesn't say set up programs and initiatives. It says pray. And I know how much I pray for our church. I'm inviting you to pray. That is what Jesus commands us to do. He commands us to pray because only, only can the Holy Spirit give you the I want to do this. Only can the Holy Spirit give you, I want to be a comforting presence to others. Only the Holy Spirit can get you out of what negative cycle of thinking you have and get you into a positive cycle. Only the Holy Spirit can transform you by the renewing of your mind, give you the motivation, give you the attentiveness, give you the trust in God to give more of your time and yourself. And I don't want to burden you by saying you busy people need to get busier. I want to unburden you, join in the work of Jesus, and lift the burdens off you by saying, find rest in Jesus through a real relationship with him, praying, reading the scriptures, so that you then are sensitive to what he would have you do. Not what I have you do, not some church program, not some church initiative. And then I believe if we all focused on that, we would never have conversations again about are we giving enough to missions it'd be like where do we give all this money that is coming in because people are giving more generously they're meeting needs we're not going to have concerns about can we fit this meal plan we're going to have people who want to do that because that's what the holy spirit will do in you he will start working in you in such a way that you will not have to find time to do the will of jesus you'll be living in the rhythm of the will of jesus and so my goal as, your, as a pastor in this church, as one of the pastors and as a fellow elder, is to not lead a church that burdens you with more to do, but to be a church family that invites you on a journey that says, do only what Jesus asks you to do. And let's see what he does. Because I think he'll do something beyond our biggest programs, our wildest initiatives. I think he'll do something bigger than any financial campaign because he'll start working in real people because you're the people he's calling. You're his church. You're his vehicle to reach the nations with the hope of the new heaven, new earth. You're the people that carry faith and joy and peace. So Jesus, I pray. I pray for every person's heart here today to be captured by the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, that is my deepest prayer for this church, Lord, that we won't get caught up in conversations about how we manage people's disobedience which is what so much church business seems to be about, creating false success measures. God, there's only one success for the church, and that's to be a people transformed into the likeness of Christ. New trees bearing new fruit, new wine being poured into new wineskins, because bad trees cannot bear good fruit and old wineskins cannot contain new wine. So transform 
Father God, every person with the sound of my voice through the gospel of Jesus Christ, may they be transformed by the lordship of Jesus Christ, by the saving, rescuing work of Jesus Christ. God, you love, and you are love. Cause us this morning by your love to respond to this message in love, for love, for the nations, starting in the schools, around that lunchroom table starting in the funeral home around that loved one who's suffering starting around the kitchen table with those kids that are already on our nerves and it's not even 8 o'clock in the morning or those parents who just don't seem to get it Lord work into the hearts and minds of your people transform us Work in us so that we may go in your name. Build us. Build us. Build our lives, Father God. For your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to respond through.